Hi, I'm Marge Charmley, and I'm from St. Paul. Welcome to Buy Cities, a program by, for, and about the Buy Plus community and our friends and allies. My co-host, Dr. Anita Kozan, is not with us tonight, but will be back for future shows. For those of you who are just joining us, we are the longest running show in the history of the world on bisexuality, and very proud of it, by the way. We've been on the air since 2002, and I like to say that we've been on the air longer than Rachel Maddow. Not as many shows, but longer than Rachel Maddow. So that's our little claim to fame now. Anyway, we are delighted to have some very special guests tonight. Uh, we have Dr. Cesar Gonzalez, who is a psychologist from Mayo Clinic, and Dr. Oscar Manrique, and they are from the, I have to look at this, the Transgender in Intersex Specialty Care Clinic at Mayo Clinic. And they are here tonight to be talking about their program, what makes it special, what makes it unique, and how people can access their care if they need to. So welcome, Dr. Gonzalez and Dr. Manrique. We are absolutely thrilled to have you here. And you made the journey from Mayo Clinic. I mean, we're, we're just really excited. So thank you so much for being here tonight. Well, we're very excited, and thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks, Marge, for inviting us. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I'm going to start with you, Dr. Gonzalez. You are the coordinator of the clinic? Um, I'm a clinical director. Clinical there. director, yeah. okay. And I share the role with my colleague, uh, Dr. Todd Nippelt, who's the medical director. Okay. And he's an endocrinologist. And okay. That really reflects the importance of having the biopsychosocial model represented at the clinic. And yes. so we're a, with the belief that we can't solely address the biomedical issues and the psychosocial issues separately, that we really have to integrate those. Yes. And that leadership uh, organizational structure really represents that for us. Well, I'm thrilled that you even exist because as a psychologist who's worked with the, bi or the trans community for many, many years, we haven't had these kind of services. It's just been recent. So would you be willing just to talk a little bit about your clinic and how, when it came into existence and you know, some of the services you offer? Absolutely. All right. So the it's really interesting. So a the way the clinic got started was really as a result of multiple patients going and attempting to get hormone care or medical care and there not really being any centralized system or understanding or competency around trans health. Okay. And a team at our clinic said, well, we're seeing the need. Let's get competency going. Let's just, uh, bring in members from the different disciplines and let's get a clinic started. And so we opened up officially our clinic in 2015 and we offer uh, hormone therapy services. We have social workers, psychologists, physical therapists. We do pediatric endocrinology. Right. Uh, we have speech therapists. Oh my goodness, the list can really go on. And again, the, 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 the uh, premise behind all of this is that we all work together as a team our surgeons as well, uh -huh. and that we're not working in silos, and that together we're bringing in what I like to call uh, collective competency, meaning yes. that together we work uh, better as opposed to working individually, and that we work off of each other's competencies, and that's really the goal. And prior to going on the air here, we were talking about was the three pillars of Mayo Clinic, and. and what you have to stand on with education, uh, clinical work, and, and medical, and the research. research, which is fairly unusual for just about any clinic. So if a, a patient or client were to seek your services, you know, how do they access you? And what, what's the first, who would they meet first in the, in the, on the team? Yes, and so the, the way uh, individuals can go about accessing our services is doing a Google search, Mayo Clinic, Transgender, okay. or they can call our phone. We still use a regular phone. All right, okay. That's a good thing. Okay. 507-284-1600. Uh, okay. And that's the number to call. So the process would be is that they would uh, have a phone conversation with one of our nurses who's okay. uh, very familiar with trans health, and they will ask uh, questions about, you know, what are your goals? 
Uh, where are you in the process? What are you looking to, what is quality of life for you? What are you wanting to receive for services? And, and then from there, really guide the process, either meeting with a psychologist or social worker first, and then um, if the goal is to go on to hormone therapy, then go into hormone therapy. It's really important for us to recognize that we provide care to individuals, not just who are looking to go from one gender box to another gender box, mm -hmm. but really our goal is always to pursue going from one box to your own box, whether okay. that is a gender binary or just being more gender diverse, period. Um, and that's really the goal for us, is to have that true integration and authenticity for the individual um, and for them to find themselves and to be able to describe that to others and so that ultimately there can be a quality of life and that they can have a sense of belonging, a sense of competency, and also a sense of autonomy as well, which is what the function of identity is all about, is having and informing those three areas. Wow. So their first contact might be with a nurse, a nurse. who would then interview them and ask about, you know, what, mm -hmm. what are your goals and what do you hope to get by coming mm -hmm. here? And where in the process are you or where do you want to end up? All mm -hmm. those kind of things. And sometimes it might be, I don't know, and okay. that's okay too. We'll, right. we'll explore and figure out goals together. Um, sometimes, you know, one of the other things that we've found is that often individuals come in who experience fragmented care, where they're okay. going to go uh, receiving hormones over here, or they've never been to primary care because out of fear of discrimination oh, or sure. stigma. Yeah. And so sometimes we just have to do some of the basics in terms of connecting them to individuals who are trans affirming, gender affirming, um, and we'll go from there. So it really is about giving a whole new experience to the individual and moving away from this idea of fragmented care to more truly integrated care where the team members are really speaking to each other to optimize outcomes and quality of life and functioning. Why? So if you look at your team, who are some of the members on your team that people would come into contact with? Uh, so we have our social workers. Okay. And it depends. So for example, if an individual is in a relationship and they have yet to either come out or, as I like to call it, allow someone in, ah, you know, like which is just as equally as important. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. We, uh, if they haven't gone through that process, we might do a little bit of couples counseling okay. just to make sure that, you know, everyone's on this, the same page, that we're really prioritizing the health of the relationship. Or it might be that, you know, they've gone through the whole process. They've let other people in, and so we will... Uh, work with our endocrinology team um, and if surgery is ultimately the goal we will uh, uh, work with our surgery team and our physical therapists to integrate care as well. What role would a physical therapist have in working with somebody that might have some medical interventions here? Oh there's plenty ah. of beautiful <laughs> roles everything from education in terms of this is how the body works, and uh, Dr. Manrique can also speak to okay. this here, um, and as well as getting an orientation to sort of your body, and so, and I think Dr. Manrique can really speak to this. Do you wanna? Yeah, sure, so physical therapy has been a great part of our, um, our care before and after surgery. What we have seen is that a lot of the patients that come for gender confirmation surgery or bottom surgery, you know, they already have come with some a uh, pelvic dysmotility. So that's something that we only started seeing after the operations were done. So the good thing is that, you know, we have a good group of physical therapists that assess these patients, look at all these trigger points, um, the pelvic dysfunction, so that makes the transition very easier in terms of post-op care, wound care, dilations and when we're talking about vaginoplasty so that's been a big part of you know uh, what we do before and after surgery. So you used a term I think it was pelvic dysmobility? Dysmotility. Dysmotility. Yeah. Could you describe what that is so that our audience has a sense of what that is? Yeah so uh, what it consists is that when we create you know the neovagina or in the vaginoplasty there are several muscles and uh, cavity that basically we have to create. Okay. So doing that, uh, it's very common to see patients in pain, especially in the first several weeks after surgery. So what we have seen is that when these patients, like any other patient that goes for 
uh, surgery of the, you know, of the uh, pelvic floor, um, these muscles can be contracted or uh, there can be a significant amount of pain. So what we've been seeing it with the special exercises and even, it sounds like very simple, but urination or oh my, going sure. to the bathroom, it's like a complete different game. So we have seen it significantly and we uh, actually had the opportunity to publish on this on seeing how it was a significant change and uh, for a huge benefit for the patients having this type of therapy before and after. That's amazing, you know, I've been working with this population for probably 10 years, and I've not ever heard of a physical therapist being on the team until I got your email, so that's fabulous. And, and I, a lot of us just don't think about all the intricacies of what, what that involves. And I think we start learning this as, you know, we start going with a program, you know, um, where I had the opportunity to meet in other places and where I had my training, you know, we didn't even have that opportunity to do this. And I think that's one of the strongest point of our program is that there is a multidisciplinary group. So everyone chips in a, you know, a big component into the final care that is what the patient needs and patient uh, needs comes first. Mm -hmm. So seeing all this and having a good volume and uh, as we see, you know, all these patients every day in our clinic, we start, you know, analyzing all this data, getting feedback from our patients itself. So that was also something very important for us, you know, to change and modify our protocols. So as a surgeon, what are some of the surgeries that you do uh, at the Mayo Clinic here? So I'm a board certified plastic surgeon okay. um, with expertise in uh, microsurgery. But one of my interests was transgender surgery. So I had the opportunity to do part of my training in Taiwan and in Thailand. And here's where, you know, even during my training during uh, plastic surgery, we, um, you know, I was training doing facial feminization. Um, so all with the components of, you know, forehead, nasal surgery, mandibular surgery. Uh, the other component that we do very often is top surgery, which could be a mastectomy or breast augmentation. Okay. Um, and for bottom surgery, vaginal plastics. So these are like basically the main components that we're currently doing at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, we're in the process of doing the uh, phalloplasties, which is an integrated process with also urologists and gynecologists, and hopefully we can have that for the summer of this year. Okay, so just for the audience, they may not know the terms. Vaginoplasty is basically when a person is going from male to female correct. and creating a vagina, basically. Yes, that's correct. And then phalloplasty is uh, creating a phallus the or phallus. a penis. That's right. Um, so, you know, we use all the components, for example, for vaginoplasty of creating and transforming, you know, what the tissues originally are, you know, there and to creating all the other structures, you know, uh, what the vaginoplasty component is, vaginal canal, labia majora, labia minora, clitoris, and even with some of the other studies, we had the opportunity to create an even a G-spot, which, you know, we've been so far getting pretty good results in terms of feedback from our patients. So I, I was, we were chuckling a little bit before we went on the air about you creating a G-spot. I mean, you might have a lot of people coming just for that. I know, it took us a while. I mean, uh -huh. uh, we, with the support of the clinic, we had a lot of cadavers that we dissected, all the fibers, you know, from the glands, and then we started seeing that with this technique, we were able to reroute some of these nerves and put them on an anatomical position of a G-spot. Of course, you know, without even knowing this, anatomically these nerves exist, but we didn't know if it was gonna work. But at the clinic, we also had the technology of testing these nerves and even looking for thresholds with the normal clitoral sensation. So the worst case scenario is that it didn't work, but what we've been seeing is that in the majority of patients that do, even with this surgery, you know, it's not that every patient has the opportunity to have an orgasm. Only 76% based on studies that we have also done, patients are all able to obtain this. So even with good techniques and stuff, it's not an 100%. But, but 76% is a correct. pretty high success rate. Like even having like a, a good percentage is, I mean, I think it's great. Yeah, it's better than a crapshoot or a 50-50 kind of thing. Correct. Kind of. So that's interesting. So that when, when people come to you, you can say, well, you know, 76% of you may be able to have orgasms. Yeah. And plus a G-spot. Correct. All those wonderful those sensations okay. that make sex pleasurable. But it all is, you know, thank, to the, thank you to the technology and all the resources that we have that we can offer this to the patients. 
So you do all those surgeries, and then you do the uh, facial feminization surgery. That's correct. And I think we were talking a little bit ago that when you're in the operating room, you also have a neurosurgeon available in case there's some... Yes, and that's, again, I think that is one of the big pluses that uh, we have this multidisciplinary team. During these procedures, as you would know, they're you know a little bit invasive in which yes. we have to remove part of the cranium, correct what's called the frontal bossing in which you know the uh, part of the forehead is a front or we have to thin some of the of the bones from the cranium so we need you know some backup just in case if there's any trouble such as ENT if we get into one of the sinuses oh, okay. or we have any problems with the brain or the coverage of the brain so we have backup with neurosurgery uh, you know knock on wood I don't think we have ever had these issues but it's good always to know that there's someone to you know have that support in case if if troubles come. Well, that's quite amazing. I mean, the, again, I've, I've worked with a lot of people who have sort of had to go here and there and everywhere for these procedures, and then maybe they'll go to another state and have FFS, and then they come back and they have complications and nobody's there. And I think that, you know, you already, in the operating room, have all those people available to you for all those contingencies. And what we always tell our patients, I mean, um, what I've been seeing with this experience is that if they go for medical care somewhere else, there's still other doctors or physicians that are not, you know, aware with these type of surgeries, what they consist. So I understand, for example, someone who has to go overseas or has to go to another state, if something really minor happens, it, for them it's really hard to get someone to see them immediately. That's one of the great benefits that we have as well, that we have a, you know, a good group that is following. We have our nurses, you know, uh, ourselves that we're available when any of these issues happen. And I think it's also little by little start, you know, understanding how the anatomy is transforming with these operations and getting other people familiar. So it's nothing, something new. Fortunately, there's not that many surgical programs around the country that offer these surgeries. So, uh, but when we started our program, we were having close to 50 visits a year now to 360. So the percentage of went extremely high which I think is good and kind of talks also good about the program and what we're doing. So you basically started the, the surgeries, was it February of 2017? The program That's started That's itself in 2015. Did the first one. And you had 50 people a year and now you're up to 360. Yeah, it's uh, a significant amount of patients yeah. that we have seen. Like again, I think that um, what makes a difference too is that Everybody in Betson put all their best for their patient, for our patients. Mm -hmm. uh, training personnel in the operating room, getting the same staff, they know what we were doing, uh, same instruments. So basically it comes something that is routine. And what has been shown is that the more procedures you do and the more the people are used to see these things, the less complications you're gonna get. Okay. Same as on the floors, you know, changing bathrooms so not, you know, being female, male, but with no gender changing you know uh, all the signs on the floor getting nurse personnel trained physical therapists nurse managers same as our clinics so that makes you know the the hospital safer patients much better yeah and a good experience for them overall i have to say imagine this so imagine having an individual that you've been working with such as a social worker or a psychologist right. and you're you've received your surgery and you're now in the inpatient unit and your social worker comes to visit you. Imagine how you would feel at the, one of the most vulnerable moments of your life. It's just amazing that we're all in the same place and that we are within walking distance and that we have the opportunity to really support our patients in another way that just hasn't been done before. Yeah. I've never heard of a situation where you know, the social worker can just immediately go walk uh, over to visit their patient after a day or so of, of having surgery and just to feel that level of support and to understand what other needs are there here. It's just amazing just to have that facility. Would you say that Mayo was the first place in the nation that had this kind of really No, I don't think that uh, Mayo was the first place. I know by fact that there were other surgeries that were done because actually I look into the history of the Mayo brothers and it seemed yes. that at some point uh, one of the Mayo brothers performed some, you know, close procedures uh, to a vaginoplasty. Um, but there have been other programs around the country, West, East Coast, that, you know, they've been okay. working. There are not that many, but I don't think that we were the first. Okay. 
But certainly right now you're among the best. Well, we've been trying to do our best effort um, as, you know, complimenting what Dr. Gonzalez said. Um, we even have videos for our patients to show them how the surgeries perform, pictures, booklets. They go through a whole process, so it makes it easy. The more I believe that a, a patient is familiar with what the reality is and how the surgeries and all the other steps are the better for afterwards. Because as you would see, there's a lot of stuff that people post on the internet that you know is done this way or that way, but a lot of times it's not even true or pictures that people show. So, because our interest is at the end is uh, the best for the patient so that they really get a very good outcome and, and a good surgery after everything. We had a guest on, the, on a previous show that was a uh, female to male transgender person who was asking you in the while we were all meeting, uh, do you post stuff on the internet about surgical results? And the answer is no. Yeah, we are very um, because that's you know at some point uh, you know violating what's a HIPAA you know the HIPAA violation. Sure. And we respect confidentiality of every single patient. So for me, even if the patient authorized to share some of the pictures, uh, as for us, is there's no personal interest or anything. So. All these is really private to each, even to access for us patient information, sometimes for these patients, even pictures and all that. They have codes for us to enter, so we keep that privacy 100% for all of our patients. So it's, at the same time, it's kind of hard to share information because we're not like a private practice and we're trying to sell right, something, right, right. but more that the quality of care comes first. Yeah, and you were talking a little bit ago that, you know, you have increased your patient caseloads by just word of mouth. Word of mouth, that's You know, that good. you're not advertising and, you know, putting something on the internet. But where I wanted to come back to is when somebody goes to see you, they can actually look at pictures. They can look at what happens so they have a sense of what it is. Yes. Which is just good um, informed consent, I suppose, and also patient education, which is one of the pillars at Mayo here that you Yeah, correct. Do. Yeah, not only that, but like I said, also with scientific information, some research that our group has done. So I think that all this in a different way helps the patient understand the whole process. Because for me, I believe that a lot of people call it like the last stage of a transition. But I think that it's actually the opposite. It's the beginning of a, a new everything. Yeah. Because it's, you know, getting used to, you know, new organs, a new way of living, doing dilations, taking care of their wounds, uh, going through a whole process while we talk about physical therapy. So experiencing sex process. for the first time in well, a yeah, new yeah, yeah, way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What's what's happening with Correct. We have about five minutes left, which, you know, time goes. You do research. Can you just share a little bit about, you know, some of the research you've done and what you're discovering and what you're contributing to the um, the world in terms of information here? Absolutely. Uh, I can share a little bit about what our team in regards to psychology okay. and also some of our endo endocrinology team is doing. So for example, some of the things that we're really invested in and it has affected the institution actually at Mayo Clinic is even just, for example, the use of gender pronouns okay. in electronic health records. Oh, yes. uh, so we were able to do a few randomized studies that looked at patient reactions and acceptability of asking for gender pronouns in the electronic health record. And because we found that there is such a low rate of, uh, of, of individuals being offended by the questions and because of the high levels of acceptability, we were able to implement the, these questions across all patients at Mayo Clinic, which really helps in multiple ways. It helps inform physicians, uh, you know, about the individual. But let's say that a patient has an emergency and they need to be roomed oh, in the yes. emergency department, yes. and so it also helps make decisions there in terms of respecting the patient. And so that's some of the research. Uh, we currently also teach medical students and residents. We have a medical student who's currently working on uh, patient preferences among uh, the use of medical chaperones and preferences around, you know, if there is someone who is joining in the physician, what are their preferences in terms of gender for, okay. for the medical chaperone? Um, we've also done uh, research in terms of uh, do individuals need to stay on hormone therapy uh, before surgery? 
Okay. Uh, is it okay if, if they stay on hormones, is it not? And so these are some of the research projects that we have going on in at Mayo Clinic, which is really exciting for us to be able to contribute to the literature and to our colleagues in terms and to the health of the transgender patients yeah. and gender diverse individuals. Is there, are there medical research projects that are yeah, going on as well? Yeah, our group, in addition to the medical part, we focus on surgical techniques. Okay. See how we, as we, for example, talk about, you know, creating, you know, rerouting nerves, looking at depth of canal, at complications, uh, something that we have also published a lot is on outcomes, because I think that's something important that when someone comes to talk to you about, hey, what are the complications, what do we right. see with this? So that's another big part of what we do. Uh, the effect of hormonal therapy on the tissues as well, because we send, you know, sometimes tissue for pathology just to study it and see how is that affecting the body and, you know, again, also the surgical outcomes. Um, so that's basically mainly what, what we've been working on and that we had the great opportunity of sharing this information at several meetings where we've been invited to also uh, expose, you know, some of those results, which I think it's, as Dr. Gonzalez was mentioning, I think it's been great overall for the final outcome, which is the patient. Well, this is just thrilling for me to hear all those services that are available because they haven't really been that integrated in my experience before. Uh, we have just a little bit of time left, but I want to ask both of you, what is, what do you love most about this kind of work that you're doing? You know, what's, what's special to you about it? Um, I think that for me is uh, having the opportunity to help my patients Overall, you can see that uh, I think from the different type of um, interactions that we have with any other type of patient, they're extremely grateful, they're happy, and you know, for all what we do. So for me, it's very, uh, you know, it's very emotional to see someone going through the process, seeing how they started it. Uh, when we take, for example, sometimes the dressings down and see, you know, in their face how happy they are and and how this transformation, for me, it's, that's priceless. Yeah. For me, I would have to say, it's seeing the individual go through a process where they really find comfort in who they are, and there's a, a serenity and peacefulness. Um, there's a saying that we've all heard, which is, you first have to love yourself. Uh -huh. But I don't know if I always agree with that, because sometimes society, uh, the things that we learn from society are not to love ourselves if we're different. Yep. And so sometimes we just need that other person to, in my perspective, therapeutically love yes. someone so yes. that they can understand what that need is, to feel loved and what that feels like, and to be able to go out in the world and to find that. And to see an individual go through the process and to find themselves, it, there is no words for that. Um, I, I'm just feel so privileged to be able to experience and to be witness to this process. It's just so rewarding and I don't have words for how rewarding it is and that's just so beautiful to me. Well, I just want to thank both of you for being on our show tonight. It's a wonderful service that you're providing to the community and never mind the international community. We've come to the end of our time. Would you please join me in our signature goodbye which is Bye for now. Bye for now.